This is the Powerlifting America podcast, and today we've got a quick check-in with the super heavyweight champion of the world, Jesus Oliveras. Just 10 days out from Sheffield, we talked about his goals for Sheffield and beyond, Worlds 2022, and what it means for him to represent the United States, and a whole lot more. But before I bring in Jesus, make sure you don't miss Sheffield, the most important competition in powerlifting history. It will be streamed live on the SPD YouTube channel, link below. Thank you to SPD and Elenco for your continued partnership with Powerlifting America. If you're looking to compete in drug-tested powerlifting, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure you go to powerlifting-america.com become a member check out our event page for all of our upcoming events on our store page for pa merch and follow us on instagram at powerlifting underscore america okay with that let's get to our quick check-in with jesus Oliveras. what's up i got the two-time super heavyweight champion of the world jesus Oliveras in the house what's up man how are you doing hey what's up paul uh i'm doing pretty good man just uh woke up not too long ago getting ready for this pod but besides that man everything is well i'm extremely blessed feeling pretty good uh a lot better than i was expecting to at this point in time so hey man can't complain yeah man so we'll jump right into it i mean we're 10 days out i mean i'm getting (laughs) i get goosebumps even thinking about it man it's been this has been so long in the making we're 10 days out from sheffield you know biggest powerlifting meet of all time most important powerlifting meet in history biggest money meet ever um And so how is prep going for you? How are you feeling at this point? You know, usually 10 days out, people feeling pretty banged up. Yeah. um, I was feeling pretty banged up last week, but um, I made sure just to eat a little bit of a surplus this past weekend. Ate pretty good. Um, And then as most of you guys saw, like if you guys are watching this podcast and you guys probably saw like my, my session on Monday and it's just like, the, I don't know. I have no idea where that came from. Like, that was just, like, an explosion. Like, everything. I, I literally felt like I could have lifted anything, literally anything I loaded on the bar. Um, But then Tuesdays is usually, like, my like my hitting reality day because that's, like, okay, like, squats is, like, you get two days of rest. You're a little bit more fresh than you would be the rest of the week. So yeah. I could see why Monday was nice. And then yesterday was, as you would expect, like, you know, okay, okay, all right, all right, we're we're a week out type things. Uh, Yeah. So, but, I mean, training has been going really well. Um, I feel like this prep has been just like the accumulation of just all my previous preps putting together, like, everything that I've picked up time and time. Like, I learned a – greater respect for myself and training and like recovery after South Africa Mm -hmm. so it's like I've been really sure to implement like okay like you know if you don't have to go for this weight if you don't have to go for this set like let's just call it there or let's drop the weight you know Mm -hmm. it's just a bunch of like being a smart lifter things um I think this has probably been the prep that, like, my mom's health has been the best overall. So it's, like, been a lot less to worry about on that end of things. That's great. That's good to hear, man. That's good to hear. No, man, it's it's been a lot easier with training for sure. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Talking about about what you did on Monday, um, you were talking about the 915 by 3. Um, Mm -hmm. that, That was a PR for you, right? Yeah, man, I had two PR, I had two PR sets that day. So right. typically for me, when I go that heavy, like let's say I go anywhere around like 970 plus, right? Mm-hmm. More often than not, like I almost really like don't take my volume seriously that day just mm-hmm. because like I feel kind of like a little beat. I feel... Like, it just wouldn't be a smart decision to push my volume, right? So either, like, Mm -hmm. I'll keep it relatively, like, low percentage-wise just to kind of get, like, some some stimulation in. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what was going on on Monday because, like, I I did 903, like, my last warm-up. And then I had already made up my mind, like, okay, like, I think 980 would be, like, a good Mm -hmm. last heavy single. You know, like, it's... Uh, 10 kilos away from a thousand three so it's not a thousand but at the same time it's like literally 10 kilos difference like it's yeah 
if it's there, it's there. Like if, if 980 moves fast enough, it would have been like heavy enough to know, like, okay, if it moves fast enough, I know a thousand's there. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, like along the lines, like, okay, like I don't need to hit a thousand, I just need to hit something heavy enough to give me a clear vision of where I'm at, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 903 feels pretty good. Like I, it moves good enough to know that 980 was gonna move good. So then, like, obviously, like, a low 980, and then, like, the more I get hyped up, I start looking at the bar, and I'm like, man, like, that's just 10 keys away from a 1,000, like. And it I want, flew. Yeah, I, wa- I wanted to. I wanted to so bad. I'm not going to lie. Like, I was even talking to uh, Mikey and Clay, like, just the guys that we trained. I was like, bro, like, I want to do it. I want to load it. It was just being very impulsive, but along the lines of just – what I've been trying to emulate this entire prep, it's like, okay, like you don't mm-hmm. have to force it if you don't have to. So then I was like, okay, I'm gonna leave it at 980 and I'm gonna just disrespect the weight. So then I get under <laughs> the bar, I get under it, and it's just like from the get go, just walking it out. I literally felt like I could have gone running with 980 on my back. Like that's what it felt like walking it out. Yeah. Um, and then like when I hit the hole, it just zoomed like poof and i was like son of a gun i should have done it i like it, it would have moved the same i thought uh, 10 more keys would have moved the same for sure yeah um but then by this point i'm like okay like i have triples like triples isn't really anything like volume wise that's gonna mess you up so yeah 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 but usually like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but um, I, I don't remember how much rest time I took between after my single, but like I could tell that I still had a lot of juice left in the tank because my legs and my back still felt good. Mm-hmm. Normally, like if I start feeling like kind of achy, like five or seven minutes after my single, then I'm like, okay, like maybe that was a bit too, too much, right? But like I still felt like, okay, like I, I definitely have enough to maybe hit some good back downs right so then like i like to i like to do ascending sets after my squats because actually after a lot of my lifts just because my first set is really more like a warm-up so like mm-hmm. let's say i take let's just say i have a long rest period after my single before my volume work um ascending sets for me i just like because it's like i'm warming back up again it's mm-hmm. like I'm taking something light that's going to be, like, a good jump to my next, right? So, I did 606, right? So, it's, like, mm-hmm. we could say 60%, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. 606 for three, and then uh, I jumped 716 for three. Like, it just felt kept feeling pretty good. And then, like, by this point, like, I think uh, last year for Worlds, like, the heaviest that I did, like, the week before was I don't remember if it was 716 or 749 for three Mm -hmm. um just because I was hurt but I just knew like I had to do something Mm -hmm. so then like I went from 716 to 804 so by this point is when I was like okay like like what do I want to do next like um because just because the weight moves good doesn't mean it's necessarily feeling good so it was it's just it's just weird because like squats like they'll feel good I don't, I don't know it's like it's just weird just because like the psychological effect that having load on your body has it alters like the perception of yeah. like rpe and irr right so it's yeah. like like it feels good moves good but then at the same time you know like okay like the next rep could be like the rp 10 one so it's like kind of yeah. hard to gauge you right exactly yeah yeah, so then, like, I did 804 for three. That moved good. And then my best triple before that was um, 848 for three. So then I was like, okay, like, wow, you know, like, and I have five sets. So normally, like, okay, like, I don't, if like I said, like, if I go that heavy on my single, I'll, like, either cut a set or drop the intensity, right? So I was like, okay, like, my fourth set's coming up. Um, I could either... Like, you know, I was like, I want to push a little bit. I want to have like a little small triple PR. Mm-hmm. And then like if it if it feels hard enough, then I'll call it there, right? So then mm-hmm. I loaded up 865, right? So it was 
392.5 kg mm -hmm. just because like 865 it's like nine it's like having 945s on each side right mm -hmm. wow um i can really so... relate <laughs> <laughs> yeah man so then like i loaded it and then like that set felt even better like I, I haven't posted that set i was thinking about posting it on my stories but that set looks even more silly than the 915 because on the 915 you, you can actually see me try yeah right like yeah. It, it's still a very good set but you could see like i think i have like a a very minuscule misgroove on the first rep mm -hmm. and like you can just see like you can just tell the level of uh focus that i have to make it to execute it at that percentage but the 865 for three that one just looked like plain silly paul like I, nothing, I, huh? It, it, it literally looks like nothing. I might, I might send it to you after this, just so you can watch it. Yeah. But I watched that video after, and I was like, man, like I could do one more set, but like, where do I go from here? Because I was kind of thinking to myself, thinking to myself, like, okay, like how much more do I have in the tank to keep it at RP seven? Because that's what that's what it was like mm. a five by three at RP seven. Okay. So I was like, hmm. And I was like, you know what, man? I could squat anything right now. Like, let's go back to team. You're feeling it. I was, I was, I was definitely, I was definitely feeling it because, and like my rationale behind that is uh because I know Dan Bill has hit 903 for three and Craig Foster hit 903 for three. Okay. So then I was like, I'm gonna hit 915 for three. So okay. then I got loaded the blue, I loaded the collar, and like it just I don't even know what was going on because, like, I could have definitely hit, like, another two to three reps after that. Mm -hmm. And it's just, to me, it's very crazy to even fathom because it's, like, um, and in the same breath, you know, like I say, like, the stronger that I've been getting, it's, like, it just gives me a greater sense of respect for what Ray was able to do when he was hitting these weights, you know, like whenever yeah. he hit his thousand for two, it's like what I just did on Monday, it made me appreciate even greater to a greater degree what he did. Wow. That's um, interesting on, on a rep PR, not yeah. a single, not a, not going for a big single, but going for a huge triple. Um, yeah, kind of gives you it, a little different perspective. No, for sure. And it's like, for me, I don't, I, when I push my squat volume, it's never really like, I don't know. I, I really don't know, man. Uh, like, just Monday was just – that was insane. Like, I think that might have been, like, one of the most accurate representations of what I could really do if mm -hmm. I put my mind to it. Because it's like – I just feel like when you get to a certain point, um, your mentality changes from – pushing every single session as hard as you can to okay like let's go through the slow process of like okay like how do i yeah. feel this session like what's the rpe like how many weeks out am i mm -hmm. um so it's like monday was just that perfect day of like i felt good enough and i'm like this is supposed to be like my heaviest session so it's like all right let's just see what we can do so that that was your heaviest session then and so what do you have left like on the table between now and Sheffield 10 I know we're 10 days out now um in your training are you just doing some some lighter work now kind of fine yeah, tuning? um yeah I guess you could just say it's like kind of maintenance work so mm -hmm. yesterday I worked up to a heavy single um on deadlift you know, or I, no it's on bench so like okay. my split is I'll like I'll squat bench rest deadlift bench and then rest over the weekend right okay okay so you still have one big deadlift session left yeah but uh i don't think i'm gonna push it as hard as i did uh like i i don't think i don't think i'll be going over 903 i mean if i'm feeling good then maybe like i'll reload it but i'll try to execute it at a better RPE, um, better proficiency. And that's so, what you hit last week, right? Nine. Yes, sir. I hit 903 yeah. last week. Um, yeah. So it's like maybe just make it look a little cleaner. Mm -hmm. I've been working. My grip has been feeling a lot better this week than last week. So we'll see. But I mean, I kind of already have like a couple of numbers in mind just because I want to set like these parameters for myself just to make sure that I don't overspill, that I don't do too much. 
yeah this far out you know so it's like kind of it's really just cruise control doing, almost. yeah cruise control you know like i'm not i'm not taking my foot off the gas yet like i'm not just deloading and peaking like no it's still weight that i would hit normally on a given week so it's like still stimulating it's still gonna hold that fatigue until it's time to dissipate mm -hmm. so um I have, I have a couple of numbers in mind but i mean like yesterday i hit bench so i hit like my last heavy single um but my biceps were so roasted from squats that like no, like my bench has taken the biggest hit just because i've been pushing my squat so hard these last few weeks that it's just really been like aggravating like my biceps right like the tendons mm -hmm. like at the elbow insertion totally so like i've been having to sleep up and it's like it's been very frustrating right because like obviously like i think three maybe maybe like two months ago or three months ago i don't remember when like it's like when i hit my, my 600 bench right mm -hmm. um but i will say this the last yesterday i hit a single that I have failed at the exact same time my last two competitions. Oh, so wow. the fact that I hit it, yeah, it, it, it's just 562. Like I, fi I failed 562, I think, before PA Nationals. And mm -hmm. then I think I failed 562 before South Africa. And then well, I you hit it. I hit week. it this week, man. So, I mean, and like for me, I know my bench is always going to show up on meet day but since i hit a number that i've missed the last two times when yeah. my bench still showed up so it's just like okay you know what i'll take it i'll take your that. bench showed up big time in south africa on 573 um yeah man I, I still yeah i still think i still think that was like my best bench ever like i don't even understand like how my bench peaks so well for meets because but it, it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense because like I'm feeling trash on Tuesdays because Mondays are squats and it's like, yeah. that's going to take a big hit. So then Tuesdays is, they're not going to be at my bed. So it's like, like it kind of makes sense for totally. bench to feel as good as it does on meet day, just yeah. because like, you know, add one and one, you get two. You get 11 so, days off, 11 days off from super heavy squats, which you'd probably never have that at any point in prep. Yeah, man. I mean, I still have a, I don't know how heavy I'm going to go because I still have one more squat session, but mm -hmm. it's like super light. It's like four singles, you know, it's going to be yeah. like a, a single close to opener and then like three singles after that it's going to be just like technique work, you know, because yeah. I'm, I'm landing in Sheffield, well, a Manchester and then taking a, a shuttle to Sheffield, my, so like i'm leaving sunday i'll be there monday because okay. i wanted to hit my last two sessions over there oh okay um cool. so it's like but I, I really don't know it's just gonna depend on how my legs feel when i get there um but so that's a good more spot so yeah it's kind of just crossing the t's and dotting the i's like making sure everything's uh, making sure the technique is 100 percent on point and then just kind of keeping keeping the technique there so that it shows up on meet day Yes, sir. And then I yeah. also like to think that having like a little bit of exercise to do over there, it's going to add like a sense of structure to my schedule. Yeah. And I really want I, I, the reason why I wanted that is so that it would pretty much help me sleep, like kind of help regulate like, OK, like you just worked out, you just ate time for bed. Yeah. You get back into your routine. That's your normal routine, right? Mm hmm. That's cool. So overall, like thinking about Sheffield, um, it's, we talked about a little bit in the intro, like it's biggest meet ever. It's been a huge, um, it's been a, a, a lot of expectations going into it because it was supposed to happen back in 2020 and it didn't happen. So it's been like three years in the waiting, plus all the time we already were hyping it and everything like that leading into 2020 Sheffield. So how are you feeling about this? I mean, as far as just like uh, how excited are you about this meet in general? Like not talking just specific about your numbers and stuff like that, but, but just kind of like all the hype around this and like what it means for the sport and everything like that. Um, well, to be quite frank, I haven't really been focusing on 
anybody too much. I mean, like mm -hmm. my only focus has been myself really. Mm -hmm. um, and going off of that, you know, like if I go in and I execute and I put my best effort forward, then I wholesomely believe like that's going to be the takeaway of Sheffield. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't mean that in a bad way, you know, because obviously like I've been training with Mikey. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a good friend of mine. I well actually I take that back. I have I have been like kind of looking at it out of the peripheral mm -hmm. just because like it's gonna be the rematch against the Miller Mikey, you know, like yeah. I, I even to this day, like I remember talking to an S like an SBD guy a couple months ago, and like we were talking about the worlds, right? And like who should get like the last Sheffield spot. And my first reaction was Michael Davis, because Michael Davis. not a single, I don't know, like, I know that the 93s, like, they had their thing, it was down to the last lift, right? Yeah. But there was just something about Mikey and Emil that was, like, electrifying. Like, yeah, that tension, it was so tangible, like, you could cut it with a butter knife. Like, I don't know what was going on, but, like, between those two guys, like, like, I just remember the night before I was watching uh, Lugo and Mikey and I had watched John compete in like all the 93s, like the day before. Yeah. Excuse me, on the live stream. Right? And like, I, I don't know. There was just something inexplicable about their matchup because Mikey and Emil, that is like must watch. Like, I don't yeah. know like that. I feel like that's one of the closest things in powerlifting we have to like some sort of like combative, energy because those two guys like just bring something out of each other <laughs> um, but, like, obviously, they both like, seem I, like such nice guys too i know that's something that me me and my brother have talked to mikey about like hey man like you, you might have to be a little nasty man but uh <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's all it's all it's all good jokes but um so yeah i guess like i've been like I, i'm excited to see how everybody else does just because like we have such yeah. a big flex representation you know so it's like we're yeah. gonna have a lot of a lot of teammates there um a lot of americans yeah exactly so not nine, nine americans i think five five flex athletes it'll be the first time that you're in the same session with a lot of these lifters i mean because normally you're lifting like just you and the other maybe the 120s and the 120 plus that's it in your session yeah. now you're going to be out there with amanda with taylor you know, with Delaney, like a lot of these athletes that normally, you know, they lifted several days before you, you know, and so now it's all on the same platform. You're gonna be warming up in the same, same time as Taylor, you know, that's something that probably you've never experienced before. Yeah, man, I, I am, I'm definitely excited. You know, um, I think it's, it'll be a plus because like, obviously, like me and Mikey lived in San Antonio together, and like we train every week together. So it's gonna be nice having a familiar face just yeah. because like, I think, a big facet that a lot of people don't understand about the difference between competing and training is that because like if you're like a like avid competitor it's just a different psychological process when you're on like warming up in the like in the state like the backstage than you are like at the gym because mm -hmm. I'm like, how do I explain this? So it's like, you have to be very conscious of your energy expenditure on meet day because there's so many different like stressors that you're not used to mm -hmm. that if you let influence you, like you're going to start feeling a unique type of way that if you don't keep that in check, like you could drain yourself by the time you have to like save it or need it. Right. And like mm -hmm. a lot of people don't know that, you know, that's something you pick up by being in big moment situations, you know, like, um, like whenever I used to play athletics, you know, like I was in an environment where at, at the high school level, we had 20,000 plus in the audience, you know, I'm like, that's yeah. something that people don't get to experience until they're, they're like in college. Um, you know, so it's like, and like amongst other things, you know, just like the mm -hmm. pressure, the pressure will get to you. The bright um, lights. 
the bright lights, the cameras, like having your family yeah. out there. Like those are a lot of little things that if you don't know how to keep in check could definitely like push you in any little direction that's just going to yeah. get you off your game. But it seems like it seems like for the Sheffield athletes, I mean, we're talking to like the cream of the cream here. You know, it's like we're talking about like the the world champions, multi-time world champions. It seems like everyone that's there I don't think I, I I don't think anyone's going to be affected by the bright lights, but like you said, there's going to be an additional element in terms of, you know, the way that's in a theater, the way the crowd is, the way there's going to be so many more cameras and hype and everything on this. That if you if you don't pay attention, you might be taken out of your element just a little bit because it is going to be bigger than worlds. It is going to be you know a more hype and there's going to be more things going on and stuff like that. So maybe some people will fall victim to that, but it seems like a lot of the Sheffield athletes are such seasoned pros in the sport that they'll probably just rise to the occasion and perform even better than ever under that pressure. I'm counting on that, Paul. I'm counting on that for yeah. myself. Uh, <laughs> and and just, who? Yeah, go ahead. I was saying like, there's just something exciting about uh, competing and then mm -hmm. like having things on the line and, it's yeah. just like you either perform or you don't. So, yep. And I mean, it's still sports at the end of the day. I mean, like we walk away with, with whatever happens, happens, you know, good, be good sports about it. And then just back to the drawing board. I mean, even if you win the whole thing, it's like, what do you do the next week? Boom, mm -hmm. right back in the gym, get, start getting ready for worlds, get back, get ready to run it back again. Whether you take a, a dub or an L it's like, you're going to basically, the outcome is the same at the end, back to the gym the next week, you know, and back to training. And back to just, I mean, cause I know in addition to winning Sheffield and having those kind of goals, you have really big goals as well, even beyond that. So like, you're not going to be finished by any means. Like this isn't, this isn't the end. This is really just, you know, another stepping stone in the process mm -hmm. that you're that uh, on your whole life career of powerlifting. Right. No, for sure, man. And like, I've been starting to get like a little bit of anxiety just like these last few days mm -hmm. because I wish that I had a little bit more time because mm -hmm. it's like maybe about like four weeks ago I started like because like everything you just talked about Paul I have already thought about in yeah. terms of like okay like what am I going to do after mm -hmm. um like how am I going to feel about it after and like what's going to be my plan of, plan of attack after um just because like after pa nationals after i hit my 11 10 like i had a bit of a hiccup the week after because i was just so shook after the realization has set in i'm like oh man like what did i just what did i just do yeah right um and to prevent that like i've already been having like these mental conversations like kind of already like putting these things into play past Sheffield because i feel like about four weeks ago, I started catching a glimpse, you know, like you could call it an inspiration. Yeah. Of uh, how much further I could really go past this, you know, because mm -hmm. it's like every time you push the limits, there's always a point where you're like, OK, like, is this the limit or can I go further? Right. And it's a, it's a legit question yeah. where you have to ask yourself and you have to ponder and you have to be like realistic, you know, or or a little unrealistic, you know, whichever way you want to tip the scales. Yeah. So need a little dose of both, probably. No, you yeah, man. You for sure. You gotta be able to you, you have to be able to visualize and imagine where you want to be before you even like step in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um so it's like I kind of started like just visualizing, like, okay, you know what? Like I really think I could push this even further after you know but yeah, i mean yeah. obviously like we've, we've all been preparing for this for a long time you know like obviously i didn't receive my invitation until i forgot when i know mm -hmm. it was this year but i just know that after worlds you know like I, I was rehabbing but my mentality was like okay just in case i get the invitation so it's like i was still preparing for sheffield even before i had received my invitation because that's just what like Mm -hmm. it was the best case scenario you know so it's like better to prepare for an opportunity of a lifetime and be ready than like 
oh man, like I'm not gonna get the invite because of this and that. So it's not even worth trying. So like from the get go, man, like as soon as I got home, I started rehabbing. I started like pushing uh, weights again. And it was all with this meat in mind, right? Mm -hmm. I was getting healthy and getting stronger for this meat in mind. So, so when you, when you were saying like you were, you were kind of get a little anxiety or start getting excited, start looking, thinking about beyond Sheffield four weeks ago, that was around the time when you squatted that 1025. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting because you hit that 1025 and then you're, I mean, basically like take us through, like you started afterwards, you started basically thinking like, holy shit, like, where is where is my limit after this? You know, like, yeah. I mean, did you ever even think like when you started, obviously you're probably not because, because I'm looking at your open powerlifting. I mean, you started a long time ago, man. You started back in 2013 lifting, doing powerlifting, which is crazy. Cause I didn't even realize that about you. You know, I, you kind of came onto the scene the last like two, three years, like maybe, you know, since your first world championship in 2021, um, leading into that, like around COVID times and stuff like that, people started kind of starting to become more aware of you and stuff like that, but you're really pretty OG in the sport. And then fast forward, like you said, like three, four weeks ago, you hit that 1025 and you just start thinking like, damn, like, is there a limit or what is my limit? You know? Um, and so was it, was it that after that session that you kind of started having these kind of thoughts? Kind of man, kind of just because like, there was a bunch of like, when I hit that, th the 1025, mm -hmm. the only reason that I even went for it was because uh, it was almost like one of those sessions where you just feel like you have your back against the wall. And I needed to, to and it was, it was just a gander, man. I had to, it was a guess. Like the, I was not sure if I was going to hit that weight because like my last form up, it moved good. It moved good enough mm -hmm. to still move and try it, but it wasn't like, okay, I have it in the bag type too. So. So you had that fight or flight. Uh-huh, man. I, like, I I think uh, my brother was there, so he obviously saw me. But, like, the whole time, bro, that I was, like, warming up, like, I was praying a ton. I was praying, man. I was praying and just talking to God and just, like, walking with him and, like, praying in tongues and just, like, crying because like there was this moment where I was gripped by fear you know like it wasn't it wasn't mm -hmm. like somebody pulled a gun on me like I'm about to die type thing but it was like uh if I don't hit this like there could be some serious yeah. complications yeah yeah um but like I committed to the to the task and then like, it was like a switch, you know? So I went from being fearful and crying and just praying to like, okay, like whatever happens, happens. Like, I'm just gonna give it my best effort. So then like, I go under the bar, like that illegal bar that I was using at game day, like that thing was whipping like crazy, man. Like wow. every single step, just jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. Wow. Uh, yeah, man, that was that was scary because I that's, cannot that's, even imagine. That's the worst part, man. And it's like the the higher you go, man, there's just so many more different things you have to account for when lifting mm -hmm. that it's like you really have to be a technician. You have to be a master of your of your craft to continue to improve because it's like at a certain point, like brute strength only gets you so far. Like if you don't know what to expect at certain points in the lift and you don't have like certain tools in your toolbox to like counteract, like what's going on, like your chances of success just continuously drop lower and lower and lower. Yeah. Um, but pretty much like my rationale behind even like going out of pocket like that was because I think in kilos, that was 465, right? And the record is 477.5, uh, raised yep. IPF record. Yep, yep. So then my rationale behind it was, okay, if I can hit this right now at this point in time, like I think I was five weeks out at the time. Yeah. Um, 
I was like, with a peak and feeling fresh, I can go 10, 13 more kilos. Okay. Because like, I was feeling beat that day, man. I was, mm-hmm. if, if I had not been prepping for Sheffield, I don't think I would have, it would not have been worth it. The yeah. risk to reward ratio would have been like not even close. Yeah. Um, so, but I mean, like, that's what makes these sort of competitions interest, interesting, you know? It's like, yeah. it's a beckon call to how bad do you want it? You know, it's like the greatest stage for, like, so many different questions, whatever, that you have to ask yourself. Um, so Man. then, like, I got into the bar, I squatted it, and uh, I did have a bit of a miscrew. Like, if you play in say, slow-mo, yeah, you yeah. can see, like, my hips came out under me. And, like, that load of the bar was, like, on my erectors, man. Like, that's what yeah. I felt the most. It's just my erectors were the ones who had to, like, kind of pick up the slack because, like, my hip shot back and my chest dropped. But the sensation of that lift was very akin to when I failed 1,003 the first time last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like... I don't, I don't know, man. Like, literally, the minute I felt my hip shoot back and my chest drop, like, in my head, every every single second that you count me grinding that lift yeah. was a second that I was telling myself, hey, Suze, like, you got spotters. If you, if you stop fighting, you know, like, they'll help you rack it. But something in me just kind of, like, snapped a little. Um, like... And I feel like the only thing I can compare it to is like there's like this uh, the show this anime that I that I watch called Demon Slayer and one like Demon Slayer is really big on breathing techniques and there's this particular character called Rengoku right he's the flame Hashira and there's a scene where he's fighting like one of the most like strongest demons right and like right before he dies like one of the things he says is like set your heart ablaze right and like. Mm. I don't know what it was, but I think it was like that, that little thought, that little voice in my head that said, hey, Zeus, like, it's okay to give up. That just like kind of pissed me off. <laughs> like the fact that I had this thought in my own head, like this intrusive, yeah. like, um, a pos- like just this, this intrusive thought in my head, it just like was, no, <laughs> I'm not going to stop. <laughs> I so love them. Uh, I just grinded that thing out, man. And then like, it was even, it was whipping even harder when I locked it out. And then like, it's just, I was just very grateful to have succeeded. <laughs> man, it's, it's so crazy to to hear like what was in your mind when you're actually in the lift, because um, I think this is one of the coolest things like about powerlifting, I think is that you like everything that you're saying we can all relate to even when we're not squatting a thousand twenty five pounds like just hitting a pr for anyone like i've had lifts before like 400 pounds where like it, i'm thinking the exact same things that you're thinking where it's like you know like should i give up is am i gonna get it oh no it's slowing down and then it's like oh it's a little bit of a misgroove and you can have this whole conversation with yourself like while the lift is going on and you could have a back and forth of like, like you said, this intrusive thought of like, maybe I'll just, I got spotters. I could just give up. And then you're like, your other side is like, no, don't give up. Like now I'm like pissed at you for even thinking about that, you know? And then like, just keep pushing, keep pushing. And next thing you know, the lift is over the bars bouncing around and you're like feeling amazing, you know? And it's just, it's, it's very relatable um, because we all go through the same thing, regardless of what the weight specifically is it feels heavy anytime it's like a huge PR like that, you know? Um, so I think that's just like such a cool to hear. I think for people out there that listen to this, that like even Jesus Oliveras goes through those same kind of thoughts that all of us do whenever we're under those big squats, you know? That's, that's a good point. Paul. Cause like something that I'm really big on, you know, it's like, obviously, you know, like I'm, trying to be a man of faith you know so it's like Mm -hmm. i don't i genuinely don't think that i am a better person than anybody else on the planet you know so it's like and even more so like in the weight room you know like obviously like um i have people who support me and i have people that look up to me and 
Um, I had that's a responsibility that I can't take loosely. I have to keep it seriously, you know, whether I chose to or not, you know, yeah. all, whenever I first started to powerlifting, like the only thing that mattered to me was like winning, right? Like I just wanted to win. I wanted to get better. I wanted to be the best version of me possible, but it's like in that journey, you know, like I've developed the platform I've developed a voice you know so it's like mm -hmm. i just think it's even more important now to like publicly talk about certain things as well as like making other people feel like hey man like you're just as important as me just because i'm who i am and i do what i do it doesn't make me really it makes me special in just one way but in every other way we are the same yeah you yeah. know so it's like well, that's a good point, man, because it's like I'll be telling people and I'll, like, I'll, I'll talk to them in the gym and like I'll be giving them cues and stuff. And like the whole time, like I'm genuinely trying to help them. And they're just like, oh, my gosh, like you just did that much weight. And I'm like, oh, yeah. OK. Thank I you. mean, it's it's more relatable. Powerlifting is so relatable because we're doing the same movements, you know, mm -hmm. but it's it's so unrelatable when you watch like a football player, like you see Odell Beckham, like, like, mm -hmm. go up and make a one handed catch and like lay out. You're just thinking like, I, I can't really relate to that. Like, I'll never do that. I'll never do anything remotely like that. I mean, of course, yeah, if I put in all the training and did all the things that he's doing, maybe I could make a one handed catch like that or whatever. But it's just so unrelatable. But whenever we see powerlifting, we're all doing the same three movements. And so it's like, it's so relatable. And like what you were just saying about how you have this fear kind of like when you're like, okay, we're going to load 1025. And you're thinking, you know, you, you're, you're praying, you're crying, you're, you're thinking like, but it's about facing down that fear and still doing it anyway. That's what makes it so exciting. That's what makes it fun. You know, it's the feeling after you're done with it. And knowing that you overcame all of that and you, you, even if you were to miss, you still over, you still overcame that fear and got onto that bar, you know? Um, so there's always a win in there, even if you miss the lift, you know, because it's like, Hey, I still attempted something that actually scared the shit out of me, you know? Um, and so I just, I love that, man. I think it's one thing that's so cool about our sport is just that it's like, it doesn't discriminate. Gravity is the same for all of us, like hitting a PR, whether it's 200 pounds or a thousand pounds, like it, it's scary. You know, you think the bar is going to staple you all these kind of things. You, we all go through those same process. And so very cool to hear you talking about that because I think it makes it so people can really relate um, and, and think, you know, like, like you going through the same things as us. You're not, you're a human, just like us. You're not a machine, you know? Yeah. And I also, like, I feel like a lot of people also tend to forget that you know, it's like we're, we're, we're not machines, you know, like yeah. we're people too. Yeah, absolutely. So listen, I don't want to take up too much of your time. You know, we try to keep this uh, a quick check-in. Um, so if at any point, you know, you got to bounce and just let me know, we'll wrap it up. I want to kind of just go through a couple of numbers here. Um, you know, the total at Sheffield that you're looking to break is, is 11.05 um, kilos. Um, you've done 11.10 before. Like we said, we, you know, we're looking at the individual lifts as well. You get also get paid for breaking individual lift world records as well. So on the squat, like you mentioned, this is a big one. It's 477.5. That's a world record. Um, that's Ray Williams world record. Um, when he was in his prime, that's 1052. Um, your best ever is a 450. Your best ever in competition is a 450. And so, you know, your way is off of that 50 you know, 27 kilos, but you recently did, like we just talked about 1025, 465, which is only 12 kilos back of that. So that was about three weeks out. Um, it did look like in the bottom of that squat, you buried it. I, I mean, that, that I think that was the one thing that I saw on the bottom. It almost to me kind of looked like you buried it so far that that's where the misgroove kind of happened yeah. a little bit. And it, it, it was a fight. It was a fight coming up. I mean, I've been telling everyone, you know, this lift looks super fast, like an opener. That didn't look like an opener by any means. I mean, that looked, mm -hmm. it looked like a fight. Yeah. Like, but like you said, you're a month, you're like a month out, you're in fatigue. So with the taper and all of that kind of stuff, um, you think you got a shot at breaking that 477.5? You think you're going to go for it if you're feeling good on the day? Yeah, man, that's probably the biggest lift that I think me and Joey have talked like strategy about. Mm -hmm. um, the conversation has been like well like what's our second gonna be 
Yeah. You know, like, are we going to load a thousand three on the second to secure a thousand? Mm -hmm. But like, are you going to have enough juice left to hit a second a thousand plus squat? You know, so like that's wow. something you have to talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. But. And like, this is kind of like my my rationale. It's like, like, if it feels good enough. You know, mm -hmm. like if I, if a thousand three just moves like 980 did, then I'll absolutely like because mm -hmm. the vault, like what I did on Monday, that lets me know like I could have taken a thousand twice because like the way 980 move, it's a 10 kilo difference. And then the fact that I did 915 for three after, which is very like kind of comparable to like the same effort that you would exert in like a thousand pound squat. Yeah. So it's like, okay if i feel that good on saturday then absolutely like we're gonna go for it and i think i'm gonna hit it um yeah. it's just gotta make sure that like i get low enough and i'll lock my knees out i don't know how much more i can lock them out yeah but i'll do my best um but like obviously man like there's really no way to be sure on yeah. how good you're going to feel on the day. So like, like I could either end up with like a thousand three or we'll go ahead and try to chip it by a pound and go a thousand fifty three. But mm -hmm. I think the chances are good enough. Um, so Excuse me. We'll see. It's yeah, it's, that, that's really gonna be up in the air. The only record that is like for sure out of reach, well, I'll say for sure, but it's, it's the bench one, right? Because I think yeah. the bench record is like 642, right? Or 643. Yeah, it's uh it's it's 291.5. I don't know what that is in pounds, but it's I think uh it's 242. Yeah, I can pull it up here in just a second. 291.5. Uh, 6.42. So that's a, that's a bit, that's a big one. That's definitely a stretch. Um, yeah. and I mean, so get back on this idea, like it, when you're thinking about this on the squat, like you hit it, let's say, I mean, 980 looks like, looks like an opener, like for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, and then thousand three, you hit that. Are you thinking then like more about trying to break that squat world record or are you thinking more about the total and wanting to the total is number one because yeah. okay because if i go a thousand six nine then like i'll be the first guy to ever total 2500 um but at the same time you know like i know that if everything is locked down i can go further you know um mm -hmm. and it's like i know for a lot of people like they don't really care about like untested stuff but it's like something that i set out from the very moment that i started and i've been very open about it it's like mm -hmm. um like i want to be the strongest all time you know and it's like just happened to be very fortunate that you know god has blessed me with the potential to do so so i know daniel uh bell is competing I think the week after, and I know for sure, like he's going to be amped up. He's going to be at full power, you know? So I know for sure he's going to get close, if not break 25 as well. So in my mind, I'm kind of trying to break it far enough to where it actually becomes like kind of difficult for him. Cause right now, like, like right now, like it's like for Dan, for example, like, like the meat that he's at, like he's gonna win whatever prize money he wants. So it's not like mm -hmm. there's much of a chance for him to lose any money or lose yeah. to anybody else, right? Like he's not. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, the 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 risk aren't the same. Like it's not the same mm -hmm. platform. And then plus, like he's gonna have a squat bar. I don't know if they're gonna have a monolift or not. Exactly. And then, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and plus then deadlift bar. Plus, he, he might be in wraps. I'm not, I'm not sure what meat it is. No, I, right? I, I think he's doing – if he's going for 25, then he's doing it in sleeves. Okay. I think I think this is a sleeve. It's the Pioneer meat in Corpus or South Padre. Yeah. I don't know which one. But, um, so. but just thinking about this, you're comparing yourself to a couple of goats. You know, we're talking Ray Williams. We're talking Dan Bell. These guys are in their 30s, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they're much older than you. I mean, we're talking 36 for Ray – 
Um, you know, Dan Bell is also up there. Like he's, he's 35. You're 25. Is that right? 24. You're 24. Well, wow. I mean, so you got a lot of time. I mean, it's, I think, I think when it comes to looking at those guys and looking at, I mean, even breaking, uh, like you're, you're on pace. If you keep training for another 10 years that like, you're going to shatter all those records and, and including probably Dan Bell's biggest total ever in raps, you know, like is, <laughs> is on the table for you. So it's just a matter of like being patient, being smart. I mean, just, I think anyone that can hear you speak or who's heard you speak before you're wise beyond your years, you know, you got, you're like an old soul, even though you're only 24 years old, you know? So I think if you just keep on this path that you're on, it's like only a matter of time. The only person that can stop you is you, you know? And, yeah. um, but yeah, yeah I mean, that's what I'm saying, man. Like, I'm not really, cause I know like, like, uh, like obviously like Dan's a very competitive person. So there is mm -hmm. like a little bit of some going back and forth, you know, not, not, yeah. not a lot. Yeah. So it's like, um, uh, you know, I mean, it's a very likely chance that like he could still like, let's just say I hit 25, 50, you know, or yeah. like, hypothetically speaking i do break his rap all-time record you know and i go yeah. 2607 like there's just so many variables that he can have at his disposal that he could still somehow just bring something and you know break that yeah. right but yeah. at the same time like i am well aware you know like i have time on my side you know, yep. like I would, I would like to have the record now, you know, like, don't get me wrong. Like, yeah, just because I know that eventually, like I am going to have it doesn't mean I want it any list now, you know, yeah, like that's course. just a sports, yeah. you know, like that's, I want my name tied to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're all, we're all very impatient, you know, but I mean, I think like you, you have the luxury of also you're, you're going to Sheffield and you're going to be you know, competing for the overall prize, which is like $50,000 or 50,000 uh, British pounds, whatever that converts to. And I mean, that's the more immediate short term is like, if you could win Sheffield, that would be massive, you know, because yeah. a lot of these kind of competitions, you don't see super heavies being ultra competitive because of the way they score based off of dots or good lift points or whatever it is. But in this case, like, like you have a legit shot at winning this whole thing. If you put together a huge total, um, and you don't like overextend yourself on any one given lift, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad you brought up Doc, Paul, because yeah. if I, if I hit what I want to hit, then I will also be like out of everybody else, like chirping about it. Like I'll hit 600 before they do. So mm -hmm. that'll mm -hmm. also be like another, that's also another chip on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. Uh, it's tough for some of the super heavies to get in at 600. I mean, not, I mean, I don't think hardly anyone who who has hit 600 for men. I know Leah has hit it. Has, uh, has Taylor come um, close to it with his? I think Taylor might have hit it in 2021. Yeah. When he had like his best meet so yeah. far. I think he had like a yeah, little bit 608. Over six. Yep. 608. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. But other than that, I mean, yeah, not a lot of men going above 600 on dots, um, especially tested mm -hmm. and, and not in equipment and stuff like that. OK, so getting back to some of these numbers real quick, the um, last one is deadlift. Um, the the world records 398.5. You've done 402.5. You did a, a 410 that moved very nice last mm -hmm. week as uh, 410, 903 pounds moved very fast is that your biggest is that your biggest gym uh no, deadlift? No. my biggest gym deadlift was 413 i okay. did um 910 and that one was probably even better than the 903 like that one was executed way better like when was my that? lockout was this was uh this was the same week i bent 600 so maybe like two three months like three months yeah. ago maybe okay okay nice i'm keeping notes and stuff here so we can pull yeah. this footage uh and put it over this and uh next week you know we'll be making some some reels and stuff hyping you guys up for sheffield so i mean it looks like i mean deadlift world records definitely going down um squat world record is going to be a feel it out but we add this all up total world records going to fall is what it sounds like. I mean, it's like damn near, uh, I mean, unless, you know, knock on wood, we don't want to tempt the powerlifting gods, 
But if you're a betting man, I bet on Jesus Oliveira to break that total world record as well. So that's pretty exciting stuff, man. I'm pumped for you. Who's going over to Sheffield with you? Um, so it'll be my girlfriend. She's going with me like the day that I leave. So she'll uh -huh. be helping me out with stuff. And then my mom, um, Pablo, and my two older brothers and wow. one of my brother's wives. So I think that's six, five. That's amazing, five man. People. Yeah. So I have a pretty good chunk of my family coming. And then um, Sharia just checked last night that Sheffield is only five hours ahead of Texas. So it's like um, my family will still be able to watch without having to get up at four in the morning yeah, or something like, like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like we had to do for South Africa. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to run through a couple more things if you got time, man. Um, Not for sure. We're good. Um, so I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about 2022 a little bit. Um, you had a hell of a year. I mean, you set PA Nats on fire with that 992 squat. I was in the room. I mean, it was electric. It was crazy. It was a huge squat. You go nine for nine at PA Nats and put up your biggest total ever, um, which I'm going to switch back here to kilos. Biggest total ever, 1110. You know, and that's what happens when you go nine for nine, you put up a big total, you know, then you go to worlds, you go five for nine, still win your second title. Um, you still win the world championship by over 70 kilos, but your total dropped quite a bit there, you know, like, yeah. like damn near, damn near hundred kilos. And that's, you know, 90 kilos, whatever, 85 kilos, something like that. That's what happens though, the difference between when you go nine for nine, when you go five for nine. So just tell us a little bit about what was going on at Worlds and uh, what led to that kind of performance. Yeah, man, so, shoot, man, I'm starting to sound like a little old lady, little old man <laughs> talking about it, but uh, no, yeah, man. So I got her four weeks out from South Africa. It was like oh. some low back, like right hip impingement that is just, made it like it was just painful getting around like outside of the gym like moving around at home mm -hmm. getting it out of my car um everything everything was just like showering you know like, like everything was just not fun man it was a very um I mean not I'm not gonna say that it was like debilitating mentally because like I've had two surgeries before where I had to rehab for 10 mm -hmm. months so like I know how to be patient when it comes to rehab and just being hurt or injured or post-surgery but the fact that it was like right before worlds you know like I even thought about pulling out um while I was kind of recovering because I think I was only benching after that fourth week out mark until the last week before we left okay so um it was that was hard man like I think and then I re-aggravated it I got I got to a point to where I was like around 70 80 percent right mm -hmm. so like I was I had some confidence that like I was just gonna go in and hit the 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 total criteria the criteria total or whatever I think it was like 10 like 1055 or something like that like I knew I could hit that right based off being like 80 like 80 70 percent yeah but uh so i hit my opener i got it and then i just remember cutting it a little high on my second just because i was trying to protect that area of my body like i didn't want to aggravate it again mm -hmm. and then they red lighted me so then like i knew like i was like dang man i'm gonna have to potentially risk hurting myself again to hit this third squat and i sunk it I got it up and then they still red lighted me for it. Um, I think they called me on soft knees or something, but it's like, I don't think people understand that like you really can't have soft knees when you're squatting that much weight because yeah. on the way up, like if you don't have that full extension, then like you're just gonna be kind of off balance. But anyways, they gave me the red light. I didn't get the lift. Um, it was very disappointing. And then I just remember like walking back to the stage to like get my knee sleeves off and get ready for bench. Like, 
you know, I was, I was in a pinch bad, like up in my head, you know, I was like, like, do I even, do I even continue? Like, like, what, is, what am I doing here? But like, I know myself pretty well. And I knew one thing. And that thing is, if I didn't leave everything I had out there, I would have a very hard time looking at myself in the mirror. So like, literally like that mid walk, like that's when I committed, I was like, you know what, man, like, even if I don't hit the total, even if I don't hit any PRs, if I don't do good, like I'm still going to go out there and I'm still going to pour my heart out and I'm still going to ultimately leave whatever I have on the day. And that's what that was. You know, it was five for nine. It was 90 keys off my best. And, you know, three for three, for three on bench, though. I mean, you went back there, got your head right. Like you said, I mean, it's like, so all that whole conversation that you just told us, that all happened in your head while you're mm -hmm. walking off the platform. And then by the time you get back to your warm up area, you're like ready to go for bench. Is that right? Or were you still thinking about it? Man, I, that whole thing was just, it was just the internal conflict, the entire me. Because <laughs> I don't think people understand, like, like at IPF World, it's such a different caliber of meat the speed, the officiating, um, the timing of everything, like mm -hmm. nothing compares to it because like your flights are so fast that you maybe have seven minutes in between your attempts. Yeah. Excuse me. And then you only have 10 minutes to warm up if you're the last lifter for bench, excuse me. And then, um, like it's just it'll test you man yeah worlds worlds is a gut check yeah because it'll test like if you're if you don't have things going your way it's like the hardest meat the worst meat to have like your worst meat the hardest to have your worst so it's like it just it just took a lot out of me man it, it took a lot out of me um but it definitely lit a fire under me to just like improve on the little things even more just because up until that point like i had never missed a squat on depth or any call ever um yeah. wow and, that's right i'm looking i'm looking at your open holy shit yeah you, yeah, man. you don't and, have a single miss lift on squat and like at the banquet i was talking to one of the ref one of my side refs and i walked up to him and i was like you know you guys fudged me up on that third squat right yeah. and like he just took a sip of his beer and he looked at me and he was like yeah bro we fudged you up on that squat and i was just like gosh dang man yeah uh but um i mean like that's sports you know like yep you know they could give you a bad call on a good lift or they can give you a good call on a bad lift it just that's where you calculate human error you know, like nobody's perfect. So it's just, I mean, shit, uh, stuff like that it happens to the best of us, you know? So you just kind of have to shrug it off and move on. I mean, it happens in the Super Bowl, you know? I mean, it happens, mm -hmm. it happens every, it happens in sports. That sports, like you said, I mean, I love your mentality. Um, that's a, that's a, you know, champion mindset right there. We just got to do what we can do, move on, you know, control what we can control. And then back to the drawing board, you know, after something like this and just get healthy. And then let's run it back again this year in Malta. You know, I sh you still got a lot of things on your future too. I think that's probably helpful. You know, you come off something like that, like you still, like you said, lights a fire under you. You still got you still got the dub by by oh, seventy kilos. Still got the world championship. So two time world champion. And then it's like even on your worst day, you're winning by seventy kilos, right? <laughs> so it's like that. That's got to feel good when you put it in this perspective a little bit. But then you got time to get back to the drawing board, work things out, get healthy revamp work towards Sheffield even though you didn't have the invite and then of course you're always working towards the next worlds anyway so but um you won your first title with USVI you won your second title with USA you know what was that like you know bringing that title back to USA for super heavies um wearing the USA across the chest and then hearing the national anthem you know the US national anthem playing when you're in South Africa was, how did that feel? Like, what was the difference between those two, two world titles? That was, so, all right, let's, let's strip away 
the numbers and the performance, and let's just compare them win to win. Yeah. Um, whenever they were playing the USVI national anthem, you know, like no disrespect to Kimberly Wofford or like the whole USVI team, you know, like Gene Bell, he's yeah. a big presence in the USVI at TSS, you know, like chop it up with that with him a lot. Um, but I had never heard the USVI national anthem up until that point. So it was just like all right, cool, you know, first Worlds, like, felt good, you know, world champ. But then despite having, like, the performance that I had, you know, despite being hurt and, like, hobbling around, hearing the U, the, the USA anthem, now that was a very, like, memorable moment because, like, the lights are on you, like, they're playing it for everyone to hear from all over the world. Like, this is an anthem that you literally grow up listening to and hearing you know and like you get to watch like other athletes um experience the same thing you know like at the olympics you know like whenever yeah. somebody from usa wins they play the national the national anthem and then just to be able to like experience that like i don't know man it was just like it was just a very majestic moment getting to have that opportunity and that moment made like the entire meet a little better because it's just like I didn't I didn't expect to kind of start tearing up or nothing but it was just like like the the magnitude of like kind of realizing like oh snap like you know I just I won and I was representing the United States of America you know best country in the world and it's just like like dang man it was just it was sweet it was very very sweet that's good, man. It was like a little cherry on top of a, of a kind of a shitty day, you know, but I yeah, mean, it kind of, and was it putting things into perspective a little bit too? Like, was that when you kind of, was that when kind of the, the rebound or like the back to the drawing board, like kind of started happening where it's like, okay, we're starting to get this bad taste out of our mouth a little bit. Nah, man, I wasn't until then. Cause after <laughs> that still- me, man, like I was, I was still like upset, yeah. man. I was upset for a long time after that, man. Like, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm still like, yeah, like I can say I moved on and like, I don't really feel negatively towards it, but it's not a, it's not a good memory. You're not so, going to forget. You're not going to yeah, forget how that felt. I, I can't, man. So like, I, I just remember like my one thought when I came back and I started rehabbing was just like, like, I'm going to make my depth even better. Um, and I feel like I've certainly improved on that. Um, so yeah, just, just get away to the day. Yeah. Okay. A uh, couple, couple quick questions and stuff before I'll, I'll let you go get out of here, man. And I really appreciate you taking the time for this and giving some extra time here. Um, what's your relationship like with Ray? Are you guys friends in real life? Have you guys ever met in real life? No, we haven't had the opportunity yet, man. Okay. I, that is one thing that I wish, um, that's what, that's one thing I want to do, man. Like I want to, I want to sit down with him, like eat breakfast or something and just like chop it up, like see what I can learn. Um, just because like, you know, like I don't think I would be here without him, you know, because like he set the, he was literally like the, the person I was chasing for like three years, you know? So it's like, and then he's just a very monumental person in strength sports, you know, like forget about powerlifting, like talk about strength sports as a whole. Like you, you put strongman powerlifting. Um, I mean, I guess you could put like Olympic, Olympic lifting. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know about CrossFit, maybe, maybe a little bit like a little toe in the game for strength sports but it's like ray is like a monumental figure like when you think about like the ogs it's like ray mark henry you know like those are like two big uh inspirations for me it's like mark henry uh ray um that's all i can that's like just the two people i can think about right now yeah but no man I, unfortunately i have not had the opportunity like me and ray like we'll dm every now and then um mm-hmm. But it's just been, like, a lot of positive interactions, you know. Like, I think one time we were talking about it, he was like, hey, man, like, I know though, I know everybody wants to see us, like, 
beef with each other, but I just want you to know that like I have nothing but respect for what you're doing, man. Like it's good to see somebody else do what I what I've done before, um, and like that. But that meant a lot for me, uh, to me, for him to say that. And then I remember when he got COVID in 2021, right? Or was it 22? Yeah. It was last year. It was okay. Yeah. Or 22. I don't remember. One of the two nationals, he got COVID. So he wasn't able to go, you know. And I remember like I messaged him and I was like, hey, man, like, or like we talked about it, about like, him being sick and not being there. Um, and then like obviously like this past, like two weekends ago, right? Was yeah. uh, pre nationals. Uh, he was in Austin, but I had family in home. Uh, no, my brother was competing. My bad. Yeah. So like, instead of going to go watch Ray, like I was watching my brother. Yeah, yeah. Um. So it's just. Um. But I know, like, like I'll probably see him sooner than later, just because yep. like he's still very active, like doing other stuff besides lifting. Like I know he just. Uh, became a co-owner in somewhere in the DMV yeah. and then like people were always like flying him out to like go to the Arnold or go here go do that so I know we'll we'll cross paths and break some bread someday but yeah man I I got to meet him and uh he's just a huge inspiration I mean a huge like the crowd like kind of similar to when you came out and squatted that 992 just absolutely amazing and uh he's a great guy super nice and just inspires everyone definitely go listen to his press conference that we did after if mm-hmm. you haven't already and hear what the kind of things he was talking about it was amazing man he had us all kind of in tears you know the way he was really hard on himself and then the way his coaches kind of lifted him up picked him up and stuff like that afterwards and, yeah. and then by by the time we go out to eat dinner it was kind of like last year when you were there we all went out to dinner and stuff and got to talk to him and by that time he's like you know, he had a bad performance, didn't have a great day, but by that time, it's like he's back to being himself and back to inspiring everyone at the table, chopping it up with everyone, giving his time real generously and everything like that. So it was it was really nice to to meet him and everything. So I can't wait for you to do it because I'm sure it's he's he's such a nice guy. You're such a nice guy. It's like you guys are gonna hit it off. And yeah. uh, man, yeah, I'm I hope sure I'm sure we'll hook it out, man. I hope I'll be at. I hope I'll be there to experience it. You know, be, maybe break bread you know be at the t- dinner table all of you guys together and kind of see that yeah. come to fruition so um but yeah um a couple of quick hitters here so where did you grow up i grew up in odessa texas odessa and where is that is that near san antonio uh it's like five hours west from san antonio it's uh kind of so like obviously like you have texas right and like you have the panhandle which is north texas and then, like, if you go out west, like, you have El Paso, like, border towns. And then Odessa is, like, kind of in, like, that corner of Texas. So it's, like, it's, it's just, we just refer to it as West Texas. Okay. And what was the first sport that you played growing up? The first sport that I played was football. So I started, I didn't, I didn't play a PB or nothing. I didn't uh, strap on a helmet until I was in seventh grade. So I think I was 12. That's when, like, I started weight training. That's when I started, like, playing sports. Um, Kind of discovering, like, that bit of competitiveness that I had. Because I'll be honest, Paul, like, I didn't really learn how to be a competitor until maybe I was in high school. So it was just, like, I was just working out and – playing sports to have fun you know like there mm-hmm. wasn't any meaning behind it other than just like well you know like my brothers played so I want to play um it didn't become something I didn't learn how to like fight for something I wanted until maybe like my junior senior year of wow. high school because it's like I'm not a very and it's like I'm not a very like aggressive person or whatever you know like I'm very emotional but I've had the uh, opportunity to refine myself over many years um, many instances and situate interesting situations uh, as my mom and my mom would like to say mm-hmm. um, so it's like I started playing football in seventh grade and then I played up until like my sophomore year in college 
Oh, damn. And then, um, yeah, but I also, so I was a three sport athlete. So I did football, track and uh, shot put and disc, so shot, uh, track and field, and then powerlifting. So it's like, it's interesting that I never considered, it wasn't until this year that I started considering myself like kind of like one of the older guys in the sport because like I'm coming up on my fourth year, but it's like, so I never really think too often about my high school years yeah. because like powerlifting in high school, like, yeah, like I was decent at it, but in Texas, it's like completely different. And I was first and foremost, a football athlete. Powerlifting mm-hmm. was just something I did on the weekends to like get out of the house and like, just go compete for some medals, you know? Yeah. Um, but you started different. You started when you're 14 um, in Texas high school. I mean, you you yeah. did you did four meets when you were yeah. 14 years old in single ply. Yeah. Um, and I mean, so I mean, you are an OG in the sport. I mean, that was 2013. You're 10 years in. You're not four years in. You're Man. 10 10 years since you've been like on a competitive platform trying to win medals and stuff like this. So I mean, starting, man. To, I'm starting to feel like Lugo now, man. <laughs> yeah exactly i mean that's a, that um i you know we we did the preview shows for pa nats and all that kind of stuff and looking through lugo's history man he's got a deep history as well um yeah. so a lot of the texas boys do you know because yeah. because of that texas high school stuff but um okay when you're not doing powerlifting, um like what's your idea <clears throat> what's your idea of a good time like if you could take a weekend off from real life what would you do? Like, you don't have to worry about prep and you don't have to worry about Sheffield and stuff like this. Like, what would you do? Ooh, I would, uh, I would text my brother. I would text my cousin, maybe, uh, a couple of other friends. I would be like, Hey man, it's a sunny day outside. It's 85, 90. Let's go buy a little 30 pack. Let's go, uh, get some, <laughs> some cigars and, uh, let's go have a little R and R um that's that's i'm yeah very chill man very very Mm -hmm. chill laid Mm -hmm. back like and like i don't and but that's the thing like i don't do that type of stuff often you know um because i don't i'm not a big drinker like i don't really have a lot of vices that like i mean like i'll i'll do like you know in texas growing up like you're around uh smokeless tobacco a lot so it's like chew um yeah. snuff and stuff like that so like you know that's conversation for a different day so it's like that's just a little bit of the stuff yeah but like i mean i, I would really just wanna i just i'm a big family guy you know like mm-hmm. i love i love my brother i love my cousin um i love i love my other my other family my other siblings my mom but i mean that's that's just what I would do, man. I would just want to, yeah. I would either want to spend time with them, or do nothing at all. You know, I don't really. That's something that I've been working on, personally. You know, it's just getting out of my comfort zone a little bit more. Like, uh, like, like my girlfriend was just in Missouri this past week for a funeral, right? Mm-hmm. And like, we took a spontaneous trip to Houston. You know, like she touched down at midnight, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to book a hotel and like, we're just going to go for the weekend. Um, like, so we were in Houston for the weekend. Um, just wanted to take like a little break from like training and like the drama going on and stuff like that. So I wanted to take like a little break from reality, like yeah. the, before the last week before we leave. So, but I mean, I'm just, I'm just very laid back, man. I don't really, I'm not really one to go be surrounded by like i don't like i'm not a big rave person like i've never been to one but just watching videos i'm like nah that's way too crowded for me yeah um i mean i've been to i've been to a couple rodeos um stuff like that so do you prefer if you were going to go on a vacation somewhere would you go someplace with beaches or with mountains beaches for sure beaches for sure (laughs) you like the warm weather um i like i like warm weather man i i I like the cold better but it's just like i don't think i'm a big mountain guy like Uh uh like when you're this heavy man it's just thinking about walking up a mountain it's like "Hmm." (laughs) i know that i would regret that decision a couple minutes in 
<laughs> as opposed to like just chilling on a beach of course that yeah, seems man. like more your style too just based on what you said yeah i'm gonna um, just be a beached whale <laughs> what <laughs> what's uh what are some of your best nicknames that people have given you over the years Meg- i mean like mega. a lot of people like to call me mega uh-huh. um I what feel your like, family call you uh they call me jj or they call me jay uh because my name is jesus jose right so it's like double j so it's like okay. jj jj um or like just jay um yeah, man. So this was, I mean, yeah. there's a bunch of other nicknames from when I was like a wee child, but you know, we'll just keep those in the archive for now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to reveal too much publicly on the podcast. Uh yeah. what's a what's your favorite sport to watch? Oh I've only recently started getting back into watching sports. Okay. Cause it's it's weird. It's like once when I was still like doing sports like collegiately mm-hmm. i would like keep up with it a lot just because it's just kind of like what i was into at the time mm-hmm. so after that i took a break like i didn't really watch a lot of games but recently you know like i started getting back into it like maybe last year so i watched a couple of games um my two favorite sports are football and basketball but I want to try like baseball and soccer as well. Mm-hmm. So I think that for this year, like I already told my girlfriend, like I want to try to go watch at least like one football game, um, a few basketball, just because like in San Antonio, like we have the Spurs. So yeah. like we could, we have like really good accessibility yeah, to yeah. that. Um, and a then, dynasty team too. Yeah, man. I mean, right now they're not doing so good. And, no, but. And I'm sure, like, if you would have talked to Mikey about this, he'd tell you all about it. Because Mikey's a big Spurs fan. Uh-huh. So uh, he, he hasn't been having a good time talking about the Spurs lately. <laughs> he told me about the <laughs> – he's talking about the Cowboys when I asked him this. Yeah, um, Mikey's a big – he's a big Texas guy. He's uh Cowboys and Spurs. Okay. And that, is that the same for you? Are those your two favorite teams? Uh, I don't, I, that's the thing. I don't have favorite teams, okay. but I will support my Texas teams. Okay. So if I'm watching a game and it's like a Texas team versus a non-Texas team, then like by default, I'm going to, I'm going to support the Texas, uh, like the Texas teams. Like whenever the Cowboys played the Niners in the playoffs, um, I was rooting for the Cowboys during the playoffs because like they were from Texas. Yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense. And then for, but that's just for football. So it's like I, I like I like the Texans. I like the Cowboys. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I like a lot of teams. I'm really more of a player fan. Like I like certain players. Like I was a fan of Baker Mayfield when he was coming out of Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, I like Deshaun because I watched all of his national championships. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like that. So it's like when one of my favorite players that I watched in college gets drafted and like okay like i'm gonna keep an eye on how they do as they like progress through through time i'm a little bit like that i got i got nebraska guys everywhere on all different kinds of football teams and stuff Mm -hmm. that i've photographed before and stuff and so i'm always rooting for them and i'm always like well if my kansas city chiefs don't win then i hope some some husker gets a ring you know so and this year we're lucky because one of our guys was uh on the squad um for, of the chiefs and so we got best of both worlds but um all right we'll keep keep it moving here what's your type of uh favorite type of music genre Oof. i don't really have a favorite i listen to a little bit of everything but mm-hmm. recently i don't know what genre you would call it but i've been listening to a lot of uh like i think it's called Maybe it's like hardstyle. Maybe it's not because it's like trap remixes. I, I listen to like remixes with like anime sound bites. Okay. Because that's just kind of been what's working me working for me lately. Mm-hmm. Um. But besides that, like I go through different seasons of like if I listen to one type of music for too long, then something else starts to kind of sound a little better. So then, like, before before I was, like, listening to, like, these remake styles, I was, like, listening to hard style. 
And mm -hmm. then before hardstyle, I went through like a bit of a classical phase. And then before that, it was like a country phase. So I just kind of go through phases where I like I'll cycle through different genres. Um, just because like growing up, like I, I really listened to, to pretty much anything, you know, like we grew up listening to Mexican music. Um, and then country is very similar to Mexican music. So country mm -hmm. was like a really good genre to like relate to, you know, like I grew up in West Texas, you know, man, like growing up going to school, I was wearing some Levi's with some boots, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, stuff like that. So, you know, grew up on like a little farm type house, you know, like we had livestock, we had uh, chickens, horses, um, we had a cow once bunch of dogs stuff like that like that's yeah. kind of like the where i grew up so out in the boonies yeah that um, west texas lifestyle yes sir yeah. so it's like i mean i really i really listen to anything man like i, I like rap but mm -hmm. i try to be careful about what kind of rap i listen to because i cannot get hyped to rap music that like talks about like stuff that i don't personally agree with gotcha. so if it's like murder, uh, like abuse, drugs and stuff like that, because I play like, in my head, like I'll play off what I'm listening to. So it's like, like I'll be listening to this stuff and instead of getting hype, I'm just thinking to myself, like, what the hell? Yeah. So I really can't, I really can't like get into it. I mean, unless it's like the special mood, um, Church, I try to stay away from that, but I mean, like, shoot, man, I, I listen to, I'll, I'll, I'll try anything, man. I used to tell people that, like, whenever they would ask me that, I'm like, man, I'll, I'll try any music genre, except satanic music, like that. Keep away from me. Yeah, yeah, I see. I feel that. I mean, you got, you got good diversity in there. I mean, um, and it sounds like a lot of the stuff, like that, the stuff that you're talking about, um, at the beginning, that's what you listen to, like when you're lifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And what kind of movies? What genre of movies? Mm, um, I like I like action movies. Um, like rom coms are pretty funny. Mm -hmm. Um, like fictional. Like right now, I'm in the middle of introducing like harry potter to my girlfriend okay like i told me yeah, i told my girlfriend like whenever we first started dating i asked her like have you seen lord of the rings have you seen harry potter um i forgot it was like one other like series i can't remember but i told mm -hmm. her i was like look it might not be now but there will come a day when we're gonna binge these movies and we're gonna introduce you to these nice these uh these uh these series so but right now we're like in the our, like our harry potter phase like i've already seen the movies like mm -hmm. i grew up in a very um what's the word like my family was a bunch of readers okay so like growing up like it was something that we would like talk about or brag about it's just like reading and if you ever like happen to have the opportunity to eat with us you'll just notice that there's a certain level of vernacular that is being used and if things start to get argumentative or like people start to debate like it just spirals on upward from there and it's like if you don't understand what somebody's saying then like you're screwed so there was always <laughs> like this sense of having to be like um a little bit smarter than most people would yeah want to be so it's like me that's cool, man. That's cool. Um, okay. Last one I'll ask um, is just what's your go-to food order? We got to ask a super heavy way about food. Ooh. I'll give this one real quick. I got I to gotta do one off the top of my head. So there's this new place that just opened up in San Antonio called Teriyaki Madness. Um, and their serving sizes are very plentiful. So <laughs> I'll just get like some teriyaki beef with teriyaki chicken with like, I think... I think they serve like two cups of rice. I'm not sure with like some vegetables. So it's like, I try to eat very clean. Um, or like if we go to all you can eat sushi, you know, then like I can, I'll just get like some salmon nigiri, some tuna nigiri. Um, and then I, that's pretty much like what I try to eat. Like if we go to all you can eat. 
Mm-hmm. Or she might even Brazilian. And what you ever- what's your uh what's your go to like alcoholic beverage? Uh I don't really have one, man. Like that's what okay. I'm saying. Like I'm not I'm not like pack a of, thirty pack of beer. Whatever. Actually, no. Like I do I do have to enjoy it. I mean, right now. Like Pablo's favorite drink is uh, Austin Pineapple East Cider. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to try one, but they're very good, man. It tastes like juice. Uh-huh. So um, I could say, like, maybe that's, like, a good – I guess I'll give you a top three. I don't really have, like, a particular one. So it's, like, okay. I'll just throw in that in for Pablo, honorable mention, you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Pineapple East Ciders. Um, the first beer that I ever ordered – outside of home you know was a blue moon okay so i'll throw blue moon in there and then uh for my number three i think i would have to say the i think it's the the blondes from shiner okay shiner blonde yeah Yeah, the shiner blonde all right nice so if you guys see him uh in sheffield or in malta uh now you know what he wants to eat like sounds like a bunch of sushi or some teriyaki and then uh get them a, a shiner or uh, i don't think in malta they're not going to have a shiner but they'll they'll have some kind of blonde them, yeah and then i heard that in, in the, the uk man they like to drink their tap uh it's like room temperature yeah so, yeah yeah it's uh um i i heard that a lot too whenever i went i spent like a, a like a couple weeks in london once and uh it's colder than you than you think like they they say room temperature it's still it's pretty it's pretty chilly it's not it's not as ice cold like we would have here in the u.s or like especially in texas but um it's still it's not like warm by any means yeah so but anyway man well i think uh that's a good place to wrap this up i really appreciate you coming on here man and uh being so generous with your time and like being just so open and honest and you know taking us through all this stuff um it's really great to see your your side of things and see you know get your perspective on these things um because you know all we really see from you a lot of times is just like your lifts and that's it so it's cool to see kind of what what you're thinking what you're going through with this stuff um before i let you go is there anyone that you want to thank anyone any sponsors or uh, people out there that you want to thank um i just want to give a shout out to my girlfriend for being the rock that she has been these last 10 12 weeks um and i just want her i want her to know that i'm very appreciative and grateful of her like she's working right now so she probably i'll just have to hint it at her and be like hey you should uh you should play this podcast and uh yeah. you should listen to it yeah for sure <laughs> no she's amazing man i see her on instagram and stuff uh, she's so supportive and she does so much and you guys the way you travel together and she takes care of you um it's a team man it takes a whole team um you and you got a great team behind you you got great family support um, so I think the, the future is so bright for you, man. And, uh, I know it, the, the, the immediate future in 10 days at Sheffield is going to be spectacular. You're going to put on a show and shock the world. Um, but even beyond that, you know, you got such a bright and long future ahead of you, man. I just, you're a huge asset for our sport and I just really, really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it, Paul. Uh, thank you for having me on. Yep, for sure. All right. Well, with that, we're going to end the uh, conversation with two-time super heavyweight champion of the world, Jesus Oliveras. With that, peace out, man. All right.